Greetings from the Holy Apple. In the Holy Land, we are on the seventh day of the month of Tammuz, 5778. Today's topic is going to be <clears throat> why is war, violence, revenge, might a prerequisite to the coming of the Messiah. Before we get into that question, uh, I wanted to say a few uh, current events, a little, a few words. Number one, um, I saw this note hanging in our yeshiva, in our in our study hall in Elon More, where I study, and I thought there's some important ideas here by one of the students, and I wanted to share so that we could all uh, uh, we could all identify with the destruction that we see happening in the last uh, ten days. For those that are unfamiliar. On Sunday, Saturday night Sunday, not too far away from here, a few kilometers away from here, there was one of these, uh, also one of these expulsions from the hilltop of Tapuach, the Holy Apple. And uh, there, if I'm not mistaken, some six homes were destroyed and families uh, left to uh, with no homes on the streets basically so i'm reading to you uh what one of the students of elon moret wrote about the expulsion in nativa vote that was a week and a half ago but it's you could ditto it for other places also and there's some good ideas here i'm going to translate it for us all uh, guy's name is Nitanel. Shimmelman. He says the following, I was locked up in a room in a Tivavot for close to 10 hours in the home of uh, the family, the Barlev family. They were only one of two families that agreed to fight against the expulsion. All other families had agreed to voluntarily leave. When the police came, we immediately, when we saw the police approaching, we quickly fortified ourselves into, the, into one of the rooms in the house. And we put up the various fortifications, and we were able to hold out for a while. Unfortunately, in the end, the police and the soldiers were successful in getting in the house, and with tremendous violence, they jumped on us and, this, and they began to remove us forcibly from the home. From all around you could hear people crying and sighing and screaming. It just was so painful to hear those voices. However, the soldiers and the police that did not interest these voices of anguish, of pain, of crying. It did not interest them one bit. They kept on their, quote-unquote, their holy task of expelling us from Nitiva Vot, from the Holy Land. We were broken and we were injured and we were dispersed into various faraway places within the land of Israel. I just want to tell you, I feel for myself and for the others that were there, this did not break us. This actually gave us more fortitude to continue our fight for the land of Israel. This gave us more strength actually, did not break us. On a personal level, 
says Netanel, I want to say the following. Then and also now as I'm writing these words, I feel a tremendous amount of pride. I feel there a tremendous amount of spirituality that I was able to participate in trying to defend the Jewish community of Netiv Avot, and I was with such special people. Even though there's a tremendous mental block that you have to overcome to participate in such terrible situations, there's the block of the fear, there's the, the yelling, the crying, the screaming, that which does not leave you. Hearing the little girls and the women screaming and crying, even though we all heard this before the police approached us and the soldiers, this gave us more strength and courage to fortify ourselves and fight much harder than at first when we arrived. All for the sake of fighting for the Holy Land, the land of Israel. I believe that our fight was not in vain. I know that God is looking, so to speak, from above. And He is proud of His children that fought against the expulsion from the Holy Land. I know and I believe that from these warriors and these brave souls, both men and women, teenagers, that fought from these tremendous brave souls, we will see them building the third and final temple. Tremendous words to engrave on our hearts. Last note, yesterday there was a court case two years ago, a little over two years ago, there were a group of Jews that were accused of setting a fire to a home in a uh, community in the Hebron area and after being arrested uh, these boys, some of them uh, 14 years old, 15 years old, they were literally tortured by the Secret Service in Israel and uh, I remember this period of time, it was two years ago, remember protesting in many, many places, going to various uh, parliament members' homes and protesting, going to various uh, judges in front of their homes protesting, uh, going to um, the heads of the Secret Service homes and protesting. I guess it's not so secret if we know where they live. And this was over two years ago, little over two years ago. Anyways, it came out that though the court did not say uh, black and white that they were tortured, many, many of the confessions of the boys were thrown out of court because they were taken, uh, what they called, under uh, pressure. Uh, the families and Many, many people are not satisfied with the, those nice words of the court that, you know, we take some of the confessions away because of pressure. It wasn't pressure, they were tortured in a horrible way. I would, uh, I would mention the ways. Uh, first of all, I'm not really that familiar with uh, all the details. Some of the details I am familiar with, and that's enough for me. The gory details is enough for me. However, believe it or not, you could definitely believe it. Here in the Holy Land, uh, you are not allowed to uh, publicize any of the tactics that were used. Which means that if you publicize anything, you would be arrested for, uh, for the crime of publicizing uh, the torture tactics that were used by the Secret Service. I just wanted to uh, link you all. If you have some time, it's definitely worthwhile 
this video was when it happened. It was two years ago. Look it up on YouTube. Look, uh, put in my name and then put, uh, add the words torture and you'll find one or two of my classes that I in depth spoke about the torture of the Secret Service. Just to remind those that are watching, I myself, uh, years ago, I was uh, arrested by the Secret Service. I spent almost a month of time in their uh, dungeon cells in Jerusalem. So for me there is nothing new here. As King Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. For me, definitely not new. Uh, <clears throat> it What happened to these boys was a higher level of torture, but there's when I was there and other people have been there, uh, they, the Jews there are tortured by the Secret Service here. And <clears throat> this, everyone that's listening, uh, every Jew that's listening, every person that's listening should protest. This is disgusting. Israel likes to uh, boast how it's the only democracy in the Middle East. Well, uh, think about that one real democracy here, people being tortured and it's being uh, uh, it's, it's being um, hushed by politicians and by the judicial system being um, uh, defending what really happened and, and hushing it up and hiding the true facts so this is a terrible situation and of course we understand, we spoke about this last week, spoke about it before to understand that it can be that these people are from the Jewish people. They have to be from the uh, multitudes that came out of Egypt as we read from the Gra and Evan Shlema that all the trouble of the Jewish people, all the destruction, all the expulsions, all the destruction of the temples uh, in history come from the fact that Moses accepted these multitudes of converts without consulting God. So uh, these people are really really evil and our biggest enemies are not the Arabs and are not the nations of the world. They are from within and we must know that and it's about time we wake up and smell the coffee and know who the real enemy is. Okay, so let's go on. <clears throat> this class today, prerequisite, why do we see that the coming of Messiah or the redemption of the Jewish people, the prerequisite is always wars, strength, vengeance, might. Why is that? Why aren't things just calm, cool, and collective? God has no problem orchestrating the world to bring the light of redemption, to bring the light of Messiah. He could bring it in very, very peaceful ways. As we will see throughout history, this was not how it went down. And in our times, when we are on the footsteps, when we are on the so close to the touchdown zone of the final redemption, there is no difference today when the redemption came in, in Egypt thousands of years ago. Okay, so let's take it from the top. The Maimonides, in at least three places, number one, the laws of wars and kings, chapter 11, uh, law 4, in the laws of repentance, chapter 8, law 7, in his explanation, to the Mishnah, which is the Oral Law, uh, the Tractate of Sanhedrin, which is the Supreme Court in Judaism, and the uh, chapter is uh, chapter of Chelek. In these three places and more, Maimonides speaks very, very clearly. When he talks about Messiah, he speaks about fighting, speaks about wars, victories, independence in the land of Israel and bringing the Jews back to the land of Israel. 
speaks about it very clearly. And we have to understand why is this necessary? Why can't it be done a different way? So let's take it from the top. Here we go. We're now in the source of Echa Raba. We're on chapter 2, paragraph 5. We have two sources, commentaries. One is called Anaf Yosef, and the other one is Etz Yosef. And listen very closely to the words. The question is posed here, how could it be that Rabbi Akiva believed that Bar Kochva was the Messiah of the Jewish people in the, uh, after the destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans? How could that have been? Uh, according to many opinion, Bar Kochva was not from the dynasty of King David. He was not from the seed of King David. Therefore, that should be enough that, uh, to eliminate him for being the Messiah. However, we know that that was not the opinion of the greatest of all time sages, Rabbi Akiva. So what is going on here? What was his thoughts? So he says the following. He says, you have to understand, according to Rabbi Akiva's life view, he understood that there was a need for Bar Kochva. There was a need for this stage. What was the stage? Bar Kochva was the, so to speak, the right-hand man of God in order to avenge Jewish blood and Jewish defeat against the Romans. So the messenger, which is also many times in the Torah, <clears throat> a Messiah is just a messenger. So the messenger to bring upon vengeance and war and defeat to the nations, Rabbi Akiva clearly saw that it was none other than Bar Kochva, that he was the messenger of God to destroy the enemies of the Jewish people, and that is why he is called the, uh, the anointed, anointed or appointed one of God. That is Anaf Yosef. In Eitz Yosef, we have here Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, when he saw the tremendous strength and military victories of Bar Kochva, that was enough to convince him that Bar Kochva was the Messiah. Whether he was from King David or not, apparently was not, at least at the beginning stages, was not a prerequisite. Okay. Going on further, now, our next source is the writings of the Holy Rabbi Tzvi Uda Cohen Cook, the son of the first chief rabbi of Israel, <clears throat> Rabbi Avram Yitzchak Cohen Cook Zatzal. He has in his, uh, in his writings about Lag Baomer, which is a holiday between Passover and Shavuot, he writes the following, when he brings down the law in Maimonides that the Messiah has to be somebody that has tremendous amount of fear of God, has to be somebody that's a holy person, and is somebody that clings on to the Torah. He's not a person that sits all day and learns because he's the Messiah, so he has a lot of, you know, different jobs that he has to do. He can't necessarily be sitting there all, all day long. Now, it seems, to, seems like... Bar Kochva does not fit into that category of a of person that is tremendously uh, connected to Torah, a a spiritual giant, a person that uh, that uh, uh, you know just by being around them they bring upon us the fear of God. You don't necessarily get that feeling about Bar Kochva. So how could it be that Rabbi Akiva uh, was chose, even so, he chose Bar Kochva. And here's what Rabbi Cook says. <clears throat> uh, even though that Rabbi Akiva knew the importance and the connection between the Messiah and learning of Torah and fear of God and commandments, Rabbi Akiva ignored this point. Why? Because according to Rabbi Akiva, 
what he saw in Bar Kokhba was a tremendous amount of strength, might, and he saw here a tremendous amount of, uh, of valor here, Jewish strength. And this is similar to what the Messiah will bring to the world. And Rabbi Akiva, when he saw the victories, the military victories, and the strength, and the vengeance against the Romans, he saw, he saw these qualities as messianic qualities. Prerequisite to the coming of Messiah, strength, courage, vengeance, wars, might, strength. Amazing. That's what Rabbi Akiva saw in Bar Kokhba. He didn't necessarily see that he was the Messiah, but he saw within him qualities that the Messiah brings with him. That was, for those that want to look it up, that was on page uh, 84 in the holiday book of Rabbi Cook. On page 246 in the holiday books, listen closely. He brings down, Rabbi Cook brings down once again, the Maimonides law, how will the Messiah will be a person that is great in Torah, and he will be the Holy of Holies. On the other hand, we see the facts on the ground. We see that Bar Kokhba was not such a person. However, Rabbi Cook explains that there is a process here. There are levels of holiness. Rabbi Akiva saw that one of the beginning levels of the messianic process has to be a level of revolt, a level of independence, a level, a level of Jewish victory, Jewish strength and might against the nations of the world. This is an important level and a story in the building of the Messiah. It's not the end, but it's definitely, it's, uh, it's the foundations that the Messiah is built upon. So that's what, <clears throat> that's what Rabbi Akiva saw in, in Bar Kokhba. He saw the liberation of the Jewish people coming from the dust, coming from the grave, from the defeat. He saw all of a sudden tremendous victories. Even though there were, uh, even though there are other necessities to fit the Messiah suit, Rabbi Akiva overlooked many of those conditions and he pointed to Bar Kokhba as to being a person that in, in, at that time, at that stage, he was the most fit. He overlooked other principles of the Messiah, which is an amazing thing. And though there were a minority of opinion that came out against Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva stood ground and never changed his opinion. He agreed till the very end that, Rabbi, that Bar Kokhba was either the Messiah or he was definitely bringing the Jewish people uh, to a level of the Messianic era, which would be based on the foundation that Bar Kokhba had created in, through in, through, um, within the Jewish uh, strength and might and vengeance and victories over the nations of the world. We see by, in, in a book called Festivals and Happy Times in, uh, in Judaism by Rabbi Moshe Sternbach, he writes in this book on, on page 231 the following. When Rabbi Akiva saw tremendous success beyond the level of nature, beyond the level of nature in the wars that Bar Kokhba fought, he believed that this was a sign that God was going to redeem the Jewish people through Bar Kokhba. When the Jewish people are being victorious, when the Jewish people are sanctifying God's name through the defeat of those that came to destroy us and destroyed our temple and killed millions of Jews, when the Jewish people stood up and revolted and fought, Rabbi Akiva saw this as God's vehicle 
to bring the final redemption to the Jewish people. Now, question is, okay, we see this. We see, in all of our sources, we see the tremendous power, the tremendous courage, strength, the warrior that Bar Kochva was and that he brought, that he infused into the Jewish people. However, why is this, why is this type of uh, why is this type of aggressiveness, this militarism, why is this a prerequisite to the coming of the Messiah? Coming of the Messiah? This we have to understand. Okay, so in the tractate of Megillah, on page 17, side B, the Talmud discusses each of the, each of the benedictions that we say in the 18 or 19 benedictions, which we call the Amidah prayer. And there's a connection, there's a spiritual connection between each of the prayers. It's not haphazard the order of the Amidah prayer that we say three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening. And Rava explains to us the following. The question the Talmud asks, why do we mention redemption in the seventh blessing? The seventh blessing is, God, may you look and Please redeem us. Seventh blessing, God, please look and, and concentrate on our struggles and our difficulties and our pain and our suffering and redeem us. Baruch Atah Hashem, okay? Goel Yisrael. Goel Yisrael, save us, redeem us. So why was it decided by the sages at that time, the great men of the assembly, the 120 men of the assembly, a great assembly. Why do they decide that the seventh blessing would be about the redemption? And the answer is the following. Rava says, because the Jewish people will, will be redeemed, connected to the number seven, how, are, how, the, how is the redemption of the Jewish people connected to the number seven? They will be redeemed in a sabbatical year, a year of Shemitah. So Mar comes in, one of the sages comes in and says, time out on the court. You got a mistake here. If that's what we're talking about, sabbatical year, then I have another source which contradicts the seventh sabbatical year being the year of redemption. How is that? Mar says the following. We have a source in a different Talmud, Sanhedrin on the 96th page. It says the following. In the sixth year, there will be many, many sounds and voices that, that will be heard throughout the world, noises that will be heard throughout the world. And then, in the seventh year, there will be wars. And in the end of the seventh year, beginning of the eighth year, the Messiah comes. So we see very clearly from the source in Sanhedrin the contradiction that the redemption does not come in the seventh year, it comes at the beginning of the eighth year. So why was the redemption blessing put in the seventh? It should have been put the eighth blessing. So listen to the answer. Unbelievable. The Talmud says, and remember this all your life, that wars... When you see wars, this is the beginning of the redemption. When you see the Jewish people participating in wars, this is a sign of the beginning of the redemption. So, at, during the seventh year, there are wars. It is true that the redemption comes at the beginning of the eighth. But when you see wars, wars are a sign of the beginning of the redemption. An amazing thing. The wars are assigned at the beginning of redemption. When is the last time in the last 2,000 years have Jews fought wars? Since the defeat of the Bar Kokhba revolt some 2,000 years ago. When's the last time we saw Jewish wars? We've seen many in the last 70 years in, during our times. So this is an amazing thing. A prerequisite for the coming of the Messiah. Amazing wars. Let's go on. 
the Abarvanel, Rav Yitzchak Abarvanel, in his work, Yeshuot Mishicho, in his book, pages 60 and 61, he asked tremendous questions, difficult questions, on what in the world was Rabbi Akiva thinking when he <clears throat> claimed that Bar Kochva was the Messiah. Listen to what he says. How could it be there's a, there's a source in the Talmud, in, uh, in the tractate of Sanhedrin, the 97th page, side B. It says that the Jewish people were punished and the redemption cannot come before 85 jubilees have passed. 85 jubilees have passed. If you make a calculation, if you whip out your calculator, you'll find, I did the work for you folks, you owe me one, it comes out to 4,000, the year 4,250. The Messiah cannot come before the year 4,200. And 50. We are today in 5778. So this was, uh, this was 1500 years ago, a little bit over 1500 years ago. How could it be that Rabbi Akiva, who knew this Talmud, that we have to, because we were punished, because we did evil things, we were punished, that we have to wait the 85 Jubilee years. A Jubilee is 50 years. So the Abar Vanel gives two answers, two important answers. Remember this always. He brings proof that this is no problem. This is not a problem for Rabbi Akiva or anybody else, for the average layman. Why? Because we know that God took out the Jewish people from Egypt before the time was over. They were supposed to do 400 years. In the end, they were supposed to do 210 years. And eventually, we only did 86 years. We were, taking at, we were taken out of Egypt way before the 400 years, folks. How is that possible? Did we make a mistake? God had given a time of 400 years. Just like God had given a time of 85 jubilees. So therefore, when God sees the Jewish people suffering, or we've suffered enough, or the Gentiles were so, uh, were so cruel to the Jewish people, and they just, you know, sped up the clock of, uh, of suffering, we, we suffered so, so much that the, the redemption clock is, is speeding up. He says the same thing too. After Rabbi Akiva saw what was done to the Jewish people. Don't forget Bar Kokhba, we're talking about the third revolution. The first revolution was during the year 63 to, to 73 BCE. And at the year 70, the temple, the second temple was destroyed by the Romans. So there was a, the first Jewish revolution against the Romans. Uh, coming into the land of Israel, was from the year 63 to 73. The second Jewish revolution against the Romans was in approximately the year 110. There's some opinion that it was 115. This is called the, the, um, the uh, Papus and Lunius uh, revolution against the tremendous righteous people, these two. They were murdered by the, uh, the Romans for taking the, uh, taking the blame against a blood libel against the Jewish people. They were killed for it. And that was at the year 110 or 115. And finally, we have Bar Kokhba Revolution, 129 to 135. So after seeing tremendous suffering of the Jewish people, Rabbi Akiva was sure that, that God had had mercy on the Jewish people and the fact that we didn't wait, that was not something that would be holding back the redemption because God has many, many ways to bring the redemption even faster than, uh, than time originated. Uh, the next point... Next point that uh, Barvanel brings, how could Rabbi Akiva think that Bar Kochva was the Messiah? How could that be? <clears throat> you know, he wasn't a Torah scholar, he wasn't the, guy, the most God-fearing person. How could that be? He says very clearly, when Rabbi Akiva saw the tremendous amount of strength and might that Bar Kochva 
presented into the world and his successes in military battles above and beyond the laws of nature. He was sure that God had mercy on the Jewish people and God was going to now redeem the Jewish people, though Bar Kokhba did not fit the uh, suit of the traditional Messiah. Did not fit the suit. And then he writes an ama amazing lesson. A third, a third understanding of Rabbi... Uh, sorry, so number one, according to the Arbar Vanel, number one uh, understanding, even though the time had not come for redemption, Rabbi Akiva saw that the Jewish people suffering would bring upon the redemption early. Number two, when Rabbi Akiva saw Bar Kokhba with his tremendous military victories above the laws of nature, miraculous victories in war, and his strength, and his vengeance against the nations, he was sure that God had mercy on the Jewish people and he was going to bring the victory and the redemption and the rebuilding of the, uh, of the third temple via Bar Kokhba. Number three, that even though Rabbi Akiva understood that Bar Kokhba was not the Messiah, the son of David, who would bring the final redemption, Rabbi Akiva saw the tremendous amount of miracles and the strength and might that Bar Kokhba had in what he did to, uh, to the Romans. He was sure that this was God's messenger for vengeance against the nations of the world that had come to destroy the Jewish people led by the uh, Romans. And then he goes in, we discussed this in one of our first classes uh, about the Messiah and what kind of skull cap will he wear. We discussed this, go back to one of the, uh, the first class or so. He goes into detail, the tremendous amount of cruelty and victories and wrath that Bar Kokhba and his men poured out on the nations of the world. They were not playing softball, baby. Okay, uh, now in Pre Tzaddik, Rav Tzaddik Cohen, on page 298, he says the following important piece of information. <clears throat> and we are told in the, by the sages in Breshit Rabbah on the 73rd chapter. It says that uh, Esav will only fall via the hands of the sons of Rachel. Esau, representing the Christian world, will only fall to the, through the hands of the children of Rachel. As we know, uh, Jacob had two wives, had really four, but we'll just talk about two of them, Rachel and Leah. So the downfall of Esau, the downfall of the nations, comes through the children of Rachel. And, and therefore, Rav Tzadok says the following, Therefore we see that the first conqueror of the land of Israel came during the time of Joshua. Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim was the son of Joseph. Why did God of all the tribes, why did God decide on Joshua? Because the fall of the nations come through the side of Rachel. And Rachel descendant was Joshua. And also afterwards, we see who was the next big shot. The next big shot was King Saul. King Saul brought about a defeat of Amalek. Saul is from also, once again, Saul is from the descendants of King... Uh, Saul is the descendants of Rachel. And then we see one more time, in the time of Purim. After the first temple was destroyed, approximately 70 years later, we have the story of the salvation during the time of Purim. Who brought redemption to the Jewish people? It was Mordechai and uh, Esther. They were part of the tribe of Joseph, of Rachel. And also, Reb Tzadok ends the words, and this is how it will be in the end of days that the fall of the nations will take place via the Messiah of Joseph. His task is to, is to 
remove and destroy evil from the world after the coming after the coming of the Messiah of Joseph to destroy evil and to destroy the nations of the world who are coming to destroy the Jewish people afterwards and only afterwards will we see the Messiah the son of David who will come to bring spirituality in the Jewish people an amazing concept an amazing Rav Tzadok here there is a value, there is a Jewish Torah value to defeat the enemies of the Jewish people, those that are coming to destroy us, those that are coming to destroy us uh, that are in our face and those that are, are interested, they're not, they're not right in front of us right now, but they're definitely thinking about it. All those enemies, that's what we need. That's the one-two punch of the Jewish people. First we have a physical TKO, and then we have the spiritual TKO. Next, one more Rav Tzadok in Pre Tzadik, in uh, the book of Leviticus, page 228. Listen to this. When you see, listen to what Rav Tzadok says, when you see the destruction of the wicked, Know that the Messiah is close by. And therefore, where do we see this? It's one of the first verses in the Torah. The Torah tells us that the world at the beginning was totally desolate, was totally the confusion. And then, what does the next verse say? Then the Messiah comes. So first we have tremendous amount of confusion, of darkness. And then we have the Messiah. So the idea is when you see the world in turmoil and when you see the Jewish people being victorious over and destroying the wicked, know that the Messiah is the next step. This is part, this is a prerequisite of the coming of the Messiah. And that's why they saw Bar Kokhba as bringing in at least the Messianic age, if not a Messianic figure, the Messianic figure, figure himself. Oh, we got one more from Rav Tzadok. In Pre Tzadik, this is the last volume, page 62, Deut Deuteronomy 62. It says the following. He brings down the Talmud that talks about that there was a king of the Jewish people, his name was uh, Bar Kokhba, Ben Koziva, and he said that I am the Messiah. He pronounced himself the Messiah. And Maimonides writes that according to Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva was, his, uh, was a uh, Nose Kelav. He was a person that uh, literally he... He went with Bar Kokhba to fight the battles. He, he carried the weapons. He brought uh, the supplies, etc. He was right with him the whole time. <clears throat> and uh, Rav Sada goes on to say that though we don't see that Rabbi Akiva was the uh, arm bearer of, uh, of Bar Kokhba, uh, we don't see that, but there's a tradition. However, I just wanted to add that if we had a true edition, uh, as we know throughout the ages, many of the editions of the Talmud went through various censors, etc. And certain editions of the Talmud, which are, uh, which are trusted editions, it says black and white. This is not something that's a tradition. It says black and white. That Rabbi Akiva was the arm bearers of Bar Kokhba, an amazing thing. Rabbi Akiva, the big, imagine today, one of the rabbis, you know, being an arm bearer for, it's hard to see in our times, but that's the way it was. And how could it be that Rabbi Akiva said, not only did Bar Kokhba, Rabbi Tzolek said, not only did Bar Kokhba say that I'm the Messiah, but Rabbi Akiva said that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah. What in the world is going on there? And listen to the words. Rabbi Akiva understood, this is Rabbi Sadok, Rabbi Akiva understood that there was a certain light of Messiah that Bar Kokhba carried when he conquered the nations of the world. This is an amazing concept. It comes up over and over and over again. 
when Rabbi Akiva saw the conquering, the wars, the military victories over the nations of the world, the destruction of the wicked, the vengeance against the nations of the world after what they did to the Jewish people. This was clear to Rabbi Akiva that this was a sign of a messianic light. Bar Kokhba was not necessarily the Messiah, but what he brought, the package that he brought with him, the message that he represented is definitely messianic. When you see those signs of Jewish strength, Jewish power, Jewish victories, vengeance against the wicked, you know that the Messiah is right around the corner. Many times people want to know who's backing you. Who backed Bar Kokhva? We know Rabbi Akiva backed him. Was he alone? Was he a minority opinion? Let's look into it. We're in Rabbi Tzvi Yudha Kohen Kuk Zatzal's book on, on holidays, page 244. There is no greater Torah giant throughout the, throughout the ages like Rabbi Akiva. He was the Holy of Holies. He was greater than all sages, all times. We know that there were things Moses asked, why was not the Torah given via Rabbi Akiva? Why did you pick me, God? Moses asks. You should have picked Rabbi Akiva. He is greater than I. And we see, very interesting, that Rabbi Akiva, not only is the Holy of Holies spiritually, but he's also a military man. He's going into battle with Bar Kokhba, a major, amazing. He's one of these idealistic, militaristic, this is not my words, these are the words of Rav Kook. And we know that the opinion of Rabbi Akiva takes precedent over all other opinions. There is no way possible that there were sages that, that disagreed straight out against Rabbi Akiva. They might have had reservations, like there was, uh, there was Rabbi uh, Yochanan ben Turta. He had reservations, but to come out against the opinion of Rabbi Akiva that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah, that doesn't exist. That didn't exist. Reservations, it's not going to work out so well. Uh, we might see it differently, but to come out against Rabbi Akiva, there's no such a thing. That's what Rav Kook says. And... We have in Maimonides himself, in the Laws of Fasting, the chapter 5, Law 3. Listen to this closely. This is an amazing thing. On the ninth day of Av, which is in a month from now, there were five tragic events that happened throughout Jewish history. Uh, it was decreed, let's, uh, let's jump forward to our point. We don't have to necessarily go into the other uh, we're going to the fifth event. The fifth event was that the great city of Betar was captured by the Romans. And inside there, there were hundreds of thousands of Jews. And they had a, a tremendous king. And all the Jewish people believed. And all the sages believed that he was the king of Messiah. However, he fell to the hands of the nations of the world, and they were all killed out. And when the city of Betar fell, it was as great of a destruction and a tragedy like the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. Amazing. Folks, do we understand what's going on here? Like, wake up, smell the coffee here, baby. What are we talking about? Maimonides, I mean, he just comes out with his TKO in the end. This is a great, this revolt of the Jewish people. Four years the Jewish people were independent. Like, who cares, right? No, we do care. 
and the Jewish people were on the threshold of victory, if not for the sins. By the way, it says that because of sins, they were killed. It doesn't say that Bar Kochva sinned. It says by sins. It could be the Jewish people, their sins, uh, their sins caused the defeat of this revolution. It could be that uh, a mixture, it could be the people and also Bar Kokhba, could just perhaps Bar Kokhba, but it doesn't say his, it doesn't say his uh, sins. We know that he did sin, he killed his, uh, he killed his uncle. We know that that definitely is a big sin. However, it's interesting the language here. So, uh, the Rav Tzvi Uda Cohen Cook says an amazing thing. Was Rabbi Akiva right or wrong, folks? Let's put the cards on the table. This is an important question. Everyone will tell you today, you go down to, you know, the religious neighborhoods and they'll tell you that Rabbi Akiva was wrong. No problem, you know. We don't have any problem saying that Rabbi Akiva was wrong. We're such great people. Not an easy, not an easy statement. Was Rabbi Akiva right or wrong? So, Rav Kook says very, Rav Tzvi Uda, on page 176, in his book on the land of Israel, says it amazing. He says, look what the Rambam says. Maimonides does not say that Rabbi Akiva made a mistake. It says that the Jewish people and the sages, they demu, they imagined that he was the King Messiah. It does not say anywhere that Rabbi Akiva made a mistake. Rav Cook says Maimonides was very, very particular. Every single word he thought about, he did not, he could have used the word that Rabbi Akiva made a mistake. In fact, if you think about it, it's such an unbelievable, powerful argument here. Maimonides whose years and years, Maimonides, who, was, who, who, who passed away 800 and somewhat years ago, Maimonides, so we're talking about a person that was 1,200 years after this event. He looked at the event. He looked at what happened. And he, he writes in his book, in the Code of Jewish Law, Maimonides, he writes as an example of Messiah, Bar Kochva. But don't you see, Maimonides, it didn't work out well. The revolt was crushed. Hundreds of thousands of Jews were murdered. It didn't work out well. It was a failure. And even so, when we read the words of Maimonides every day from the time of Maimonides, we are reading the bottom line of Rabbi Akiva. The personality, Bar Kochva, he failed. Mr. Bar Kochva himself failed, but the concept, the concept of what Bar Kochva represented, that is true till this very minute and till the end of days. That Rabbi Akiva was not wrong. Rabbi Akiva was 100% right to bring the messianic age. He was correct. When we see what Bar Kochva did to the enemies of the Jewish people, to destroy them, to rip them apart, we know that that is the messianic process. That, the Maimonides, that Rabbi Akiva never made a mistake. The certain case of Bar Kochva, he was not the man to bring the victory, to bring the end of the days. But the concept and the principles exist and are true till this very minute. And that is the prerequisite of the coming of Messiah. Amazing. Where did we go wrong? We have to learn to think about it. Last 70 years we fought five, six, seven wars. There's a war every single day. When you go, you know, when you travel from your settlements, when you, in, even in the cities in Israel, there's a war going on every single day against the Jewish people. So it's important to learn. We see tremendous victories against the enemies of the Jewish people. Not only the local enemies in in Israel or Judea and Samaria or in Gaza. We see all over, all over the world. We see Jewish, Jewish enemies, enemies of the Jewish people. We see them all over the world being targeted and blown away and vengeance against all types of figures, some political, some military, all over the world. Tremendous power of the Jewish people 
to reach the enemies of the Jewish people, wherever they might be hiding. So it's important. If this is a prerequisite, vengeance, wars, military, victories, independence, what Maimonides brings down, and it was what holds water and what, what Rabbi Akiva understood as the messianic light that is necessary, we must learn what went wrong there. And what went wrong there is going wrong here in the Holy Land. We don't learn the lesson. There's a great expression in Hebrew. It sounds much better in Hebrew. Suckers, okay? Suckers are not, okay? Suckers are not born every day. They're just reincarnated. They're not born every day. They're just reincarnated all the time. Go back. Be a sucker one more time. We're making the same mistake. What is that mistake? Listen to this. Ben Yoyada, Tractate Gitin, page 57, side 1. At the beginning, when Bar Kochva was victorious, he thought in his heart. He did, not, he did not express it in words, but he thought in his thoughts and in his heart. He was thinking that God, please don't help us, but don't come against us. He thought that, but he never said anything. And therefore, you shouldn't be thinking that. God, don't help us. We don't need your help, God. We can't take a step. We can't open up our eyes in the morning. We can't get out of that bed without the help of God. Joseph, the, the word of the, the, the name of God was on his lips 24 7. What's going on over here? So God really wanted to destroy Bar Kochva for that kind of thought. God, we don't need your help, but don't interfere either. But it would have been a desecration of God's name. Listen closely. Why? Because nobody knew what he was thinking. No one knew what he was thinking. And then we would see that the Jewish people would be defeated. And there would be a desecration of God's name. That the enemies of the Jewish people are being victorious over the Jewish people. Nobody knows the reason why, we're, why, we're, why we are being defeated is because of the evil thought of Bar Kochva. So what happens? An amazing thing. Only when Bar Kochva says it, when he expresses the idea with his lips, God, please do not assist us. But on the other hand, please do not, uh, don't bother us. Let us with our own strength, with our own army and our own technology, technology and with our own strength and with our own minds. Please let it just be a natural, you know, process. Leave it as a natural process and we'll be victorious. Don't intervene. Once he put that on his mouth, once he said that on his lips, there was no longer a desecration of God's name to take out Bar Kochva and to destroy the Jewish revolution. So this is a tremendous lesson here. This is what is happening today. We think that what our victories, they're from the IDF. We think that it's from our strength, it's from our technology, it's from our minds, sharp, uh, sharp minds. Listen to this, Preet Sadiq, Rav Tzadik Cohen, in Deuteronomy, <coughs> says an unbelievable idea. He says that there are two types of, of pride. One is positive pride and one is a negative pride. The nation that represents negative pride, of course, is Amalek. What does Amalek try to do to us? Amalek tries to convince the Jewish people that there is no benefit for all those commandments that you're doing. There is no benefit for sitting and learning Torah. That's what they want to, for us to believe. And because of the fact that they're putting us down, that there is no benefit for what we're doing for our worshiping of God and doing the commandments, therefore we have to use the characteristic trait of pride. And this is something that's positive. Have pride for every time you sit and learn, be proud of it. For every time you overcome your evil inclination, be proud. So we see that there's positive pride and there's negative pride. However, at the beginning, listen to these words. Unbelievable. This is today's news. This is us. Rav Tzadok writes, 
On page 61, Deuteronomy, last book, fifth book, he writes there an amazing thing. At the beginning in the city of Betar, where the rev rev revolution took place against the Romans, at the beginning they had a positive and a kosher sense of pride and being proud. And that is nothing wrong with that. In order to worship God, you need that certain degree of pride to keep your head up. However, what happened? In the end, we see by various events that took place there, which I'm not going to go into now, but they're very, it's definitely worthwhile to, to check it out, that they started doing really, really taking advantage of their strength and their victories and doing really, really bad things to, to innocent people. So what started out as being proud and staunch for the sake of heaven eventually became something that was just being haughty and not for the sake of heaven. And that's something that's terrible. And that is why they had to be destroyed in Beitar. They took something positive, a characteristic trait which is positive, to some degree. And instead of keeping it on a kosher level, on a holy level, for the sake of God, we threw it away. And it became our strength, our power, our victories, our uh, genius. We will finish off by saying the following. What I'm about to say right now is brought down hundreds of times. We don't have the time, hundred times, we'll be here for a while. I'm just going to bring two examples. This is one of the major principles in Judaism. We have an exile and we have the opposite is redemption. Exile represents the land of Israel being desolate. Redemption represents the land of Israel giving off its fruits in a beautiful fashion. So exile, opposite is redemption. Exile represents the land of Israel being desolate. And then we have the opposite spectrum, side of the spectrum. We have redemption represented by the land of Israel once again coming alive and giving off its progress in a beautiful fashion. We have exile. What does exile represent? The Jewish people being trodden upon by the nations of the world. The Jewish people being subserved by the nations of the world. The, Jew, the Jews are <clears throat> stepped upon. The Jews are a lowly people. What is the opposite of that exile? Is the Jewish people being victorious in the land of Israel, defeating the enemies of the Jewish people, ruling over the Jewish people. Exile is the Gentiles ruling over the Jewish people and destroying us. The exact opposite is the Jewish people being victorious in the land of Israel and ruling upon the enemies of the Jewish people. This is the difference between exile and redemption. So listen very closely. How do we get to that step? And this idea is brought down hundreds of times in the Torah sources. I'm going to, just to bring two. Uh, it says in Midrash Tanchuma, Bishalach, chapter 7, it says, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh. Why is God hardening the heart of Pharaoh? It says the following, it tells us a Jewish lesson that when God avenges, when God avenges against the nations of the world, takes vengeance against the nations of the world, His name, God's name is sanctified all over the world. And it gives three cases. Look, up, look into it. I'm not going to get into it right now. Rabbi Kana writes in the... Uh, Or Harayon, page 365, sanctifying God's name. God's revenge against the nations is proof that God indeed possesses power, might, and awesomeness. Thus it says, God rules the world by His might in Psalm 66, 7. Only through His might and His demonstration of force is God recognized. He is called the ruler of the world. 
When the nations of the world see vengeance, when the nations of the world see the Jewish people being victorious in battles, in wars, when they see Jewish strength, Jewish might, Jewish force against the nations of the world, this is the redemption process. This is, has to be, this is the prerequisite. Why? Because exile represents God's name being desecrated, the Jewish people being trodden upon, the Jewish people subservient to the nations of the world. So the opposite has to be the exact opposite. The Jewish people being victorious, revolting against the nations of the world and destroying the wicked. In the exile, the Jewish people were destroyed throughout all the thousands of years. The opposite is the Jewish people defending ourselves and taking out the enemies of the Jewish people. Now, an unbelievable, the last source I'm going to bring that shows it, the concept of that when God takes, when God uses violence and might and strength and war against the nations of the world, His name is sanctified throughout the world. That's what the nations of the world understand. That is the only language that they understand. Once you use these types, once they understand what's going on, the language of the Jewish people, this new language of the Jewish people, then they recognize God's might, not through any other, unfortunately, not through any other avenue. Listen to this, in, in Midrash Esther Rabbah, on the last chapter, chapter 10, uh, paragraph 15, unbelievable. It, says, it brings down a verse in Psalms 66, 3. I see God, your ways are awesome. What, how, when do we see God's ways are awesome? During the time of Purim. What's the time of Purim? That there was a decree that the Jewish people would be annihilated. Men, women, children. What happened? How do we see God's name is awesome in the world? Because, listen to the words, we see that those that were chosen to be killed, killed those that chose to kill them. We get, when we stood up, when the Jewish people killed over 75,000 75, enemies of the Jewish people during the holiday of Purim. This is when the world sees the awesome, the awesome strength of God. This is when the world starts to believe that the Jewish people are connected to the God of Israel. We are the people of God. When we see that those that were slated to be killed stand up and kill those that wanted to kill them. The next, we see those that wanted to hang the Jewish people, they in turn are hanged. And the last, when we see those that wanted to drown the Jewish people, we're talking about Egypt now, when the Egyptians came at different periods of history, when it was against the babies, they came and drowned 10,000 Jewish babies. Well, baby, when do we get, when does, when does the... Uh, when does the world see the tremendous sanctification of God's name? Only hundreds of years later, when the Egyptians, those that came to drown us, when they're drowned. When do we see the strength of God, the sanctification of God's name? When is it clear to the world that there is a God in the world, and He is the God of Israel? When does that point come? Remember when the Jewish people had their dogs. Where's Mike when you need him? Where's those dogs barking now when you need him? But they took their dogs, and God made a miracle, and the Egyptians did not die in the sea. They still were living. They were almost dead, but they were still living, and God brought them all to the dry shore. And once they got to the dry shore, all the Jews took their dogs and went from person to person, and the dogs just killed them off. And because of the fact, he said, oh, here's one of my... Here's one of my masters that beat me. Here's one of my masters that hit me. Here's one of a master that didn't give me a chance to rest. He didn't give me water. He didn't give me food. Go! And they sick the dog on these Egyptians that killed hundreds of thousands of, of Egyptians there on the shore. This is when we see in the world that there is a God and the God is connected to the people of Israel. So let's look, put it in a historical view. Why is... Where do we see that a prerequisite for the coming of Messiah or the redemption of the Jewish people? It is, involves Jewish might, strength, military victories, vengeance. Where do we see? We see it throughout history. Number one, when the Jewish people are about to be redeemed from Egypt, they do not walk out and say goodbye and hug and kiss the Egyptians. There are ten plagues. 
If God wanted to, he could have taken the Jewish people out while the Egyptians were sleeping on their beds, and we could have walked out peacefully. That's not the way it works. When God brings in the light of redemption, it must come through Jewish might, strength, courage, and victory. Because the desecration of God's name is when the nations use their might and power to subserve, sub, subdue us. So that's number one. When the Jewish people come into the land of Israel, are about to come in for the first time to the land of Israel, this is a redemption mode. When we come in, we could have walked in and the nations could have ran away, but that's not the way God wanted to. There are wars. For seven years, the Jewish people fight and defeat the nations of the world. Once again, when the light of redemption comes to the world, there are wars, there are victory, Jewish victory, Jewish strength, Jewish might. Read the book of Joshua. Read the, read the book of Judges. <clears throat> when the Jewish people are coming back to rebuild the second temple, to build the second temple, not to rebuild it, after it was destroyed seven years before, how was that, how was the process begun? The process began when the Jewish people took vengeance against tens of thousands of the Persian people. Over 75,000, amazing number, over 75,000 Persians were killed in the various wars that during the time of Mordechai and Esther. This was the kickoff of the, the beginning of the second redemption, the beginning of the building of the second temple. It was brought through blood and fire and spirit. Number three, in the times after the destruction of the second temple. After the destruction of the second temple, there were three revolts that took place. Why couldn't it just been done peacefully? It was almost successful. Because that's the way it works. When there's the messianic light wants to come down to the world, it has to be brought through the venue of the Messiah, of the son of Joseph, through strength, through courage, through victory, through violence, through wars, through victories. That's the way it worked. That's the way it was. That's the way it is. That's the way it will be. So, therefore, there were three revolts trying to go back to the land of Israel, make it independent, and re and build the third temple. There were three revolts. That was the way that it was going to be brought into the world. It was almost successful. As we spoke about in one of the classes on Bar Kochva, the Romans were about to leave the land of Israel. They were finished. They were finished. If not for our sins, they were done. And the same too is in our times. We see five, six, seven wars that are taking place in our times. For the first time in 2,000 years, we see Jewish strength, Jewish might, Jewish curse, Jewish victories and wars, Jewish independence. We see all these points, these messianic points coming together. And the only way we could ruin it, the way that we could ruin it, is when we do not give credit where the credit is due. The credit must go 100%, not to us, not to our... Not to our a brilliance, not to our high tech, not to our military sense. It has to go all, and to understand that it's all a victory, it's all coming from the source is God. If we understand that, we bring the redemption today. When we give credit 100% to God, it's not us, and we go out and to remove the evil from our midst, we will be victorious, the final redemption will come. If unfortunately we follow the path of Bar Kochva, to think that God, don't bother us, you know, uh, don't help us and don't bother us, we're fine. Leave it to the laws of nature, we'll take them out on our own strength, with our own wisdom, that's when we're going to lose. That's when we're going to fall, God forbid. So let us pray together that we get our act together and we understand that it's all from Hashem. Yeah.